this was scripted. <laughs> <laughs> and you change. Okay. So, Dan, would you like to To start. To start, yes. Yes. So, we were asked to think together about questions of uh, social science and ethics. And uh, when we started thinking about it, we, um, you asked us to say, if you could run any experiment you wanted, which one would you, would you like to run? And of course, you know, we started thinking about getting more people to have twins and then separating them at birth and putting some people in China and some in the US, some living here, uh, randomizing who gets to marry who. I mean, there's lots of things you can think that is non-ethical. Um, but, but those are things that are clearly <laughs> challenging the, the, the question of ethicality. But, but there's lots of other things that are closer to home and are, are real and important and interesting. And uh, I'll tell you a personal example for me. Uh, so I was in a burn department for three years as a patient. And I remember there was a point in which the doctors wanted to put uh, pressure bandages on me. Uh, pressure bandages, is, it's like um, tights or like a Spider-Man outfit. It, it holds very tight on the body, just holds the scars very tight. And the theory is that it's going to help. It's going to massage the skin. It's going to keep the blood pressure. They have a theory about it. And maybe after a year, of doing these pressure bandages, uh, wearing it and I, because almost all my body is burned. I had trousers, I had a shirt, I had a mask on my face, I had gloves. The only places in my body that were, did, was not covered are my ears, a hole for the mouth, eyes, nose, that's it. The rest of it was like covered. And after a year of doing it, I didn't see any improvement. And, and I asked the doctors, I said, is there any proof that this is actually working. It was torture to be in this thing. Uh, you know, when you look at Spider-Man, I think about how unpleasant it is to be inside. Um, it was pure torture to be inside of this. And I said, is there any evidence for this? I couldn't see any academic paper. I couldn't see any evidence. And they said, no, but they had the theory that this is working. And at that point, I said, look, why don't we create two new burns on my thighs? Uh, one on the left, one on the right, different um, uh, intensities, and let's see if this thing is really working or not. And they told me it's unethical uh, to do it, and, and I understand it's unethical, but at the same time, they keep on doing these treatments to people with no justification that this is actually working. And as we talk about ethics today, I want you to think about this idea that it's unethical to do some experiments, but there are many experiments it's unethical not to do as well. And we shouldn't just consider is the experiment ethical, but is the way we're living right now necessarily the ethical thing to do, and, and should we figure new things uh, to do? So, so that's what I want us to think about today. I want us to think about Ethics of experiments, where we're willing to sacrifice some people for the benefit of society. Uh, and the ethics of living differently uh, for all kinds of reasons. And, and just one example, we talked earlier this morning about education. Education is a shocking thing in society. Kids go to school from age 6 to 22, let's say, 7, 8 hours a day. Are we maximizing their benefit, right? Is, is what we're getting at the end of kids going to college really the optimal outcome? And the reality is that we don't experiment with education. It's very hard to come to parents and say, your kids have been assigned to the control group, when your kids have been assigned to the experimental group, and let's figure out what actually works or not. So in the name of not experimenting, we have a terrible educational system that we really haven't tested in any kind of useful way. So that's the kind of the, the framework I want us to think about. And to start with, Sandra, would you like to give us a, a, a specific example of a, a research topic that is close to your heart and then some of the ethical 
questions. Sure. So we basically had a discussion over lunch. <laughs> we kind of decided what to do here. And I think what we came up with is saying that we don't want to talk about like the big, really unethical things that everybody would agree that it's absolutely immoral and we shouldn't be doing it. So what we said is it might be more interesting to actually talk about stuff that like some of us are doing and then just taking it to the extreme and kind of trying to figure out where do we want to draw the line. So if we take something that's completely out of, out of proportions, we wouldn't be doing it anyway, but like how can we gradually get there? Um, and maybe just like a little bit on my background. So I did um, my PhD at the University of Cambridge um, looking basically at people's online behavior. So I'm interested in what makes people uniquely themselves, like what makes me uniquely Sandra as, as opposed to uniquely Dan, as opposed to uniquely Moran. And I think what we started with is, or what we have been traditionally doing, is really looking, giving people questionnaires and telling them, hey, like just tell us about the way that you see yourself. So we would give them like statements saying, I'm the life of the party, do you agree or do you disagree? Um, and we've quickly figured out that it, it's an easy way, it's not, maybe not the best because we know that people lie. Um, so over the recent years, what we have been doing is we've gone away from questionnaires um, and we've been started looking at people's actual behavior. And I'm sure that many of you have heard of some of the stories in the context of, of Cambridge Analytica, which, just to be sure, never worked for Cambridge Analytica. I was at a psychometric center, don't have any affiliation with what they do. I don't necessarily approve of it. But, but people you worked with. Not the people I work with. So I think what, what happened is that it started at Cambridge, like the whole idea of, oh, we can capture people's personality and turn it into psychological profiles just by looking at their online data. And some people um, at the University of Cambridge, not in my group, have gone to work for them. But I think that the interesting part here is that like, we can now really learn something about just by looking at, let's say, your Facebook likes. By, by the way, uh, uh, sorry to interrupt, but okay. if, if the people from Cambridge Analytica uh, helped Donald Trump not to get elected, <laughs> would, you, would you have considered that immoral? I think that's like one of the, the important questions, yeah. It's like this funny, it was like posted in one of the Cambridge groups saying that if you want your candidate to become second, just hire Oxford Analytica, <laughs> which is, but I think it's, a, it's an important question because like the, the question is, is it just because it's our, it's going against our ideology and it's something that we don't agree with on a, on a kind of orientation level. Um, I'm actually going to talk about that tomorrow, so I'm just a spoiler if you wanna wanna come. Um, but it's really, and I think this is like the question that you raise is the important one is like what are we doing with that? Um, but like maybe just to take a step back. Um, so what we can do now is basically without you being aware, without you having to do anything, we can learn about your psychology, we can learn about your personality, we can predict your values, your political orientation, your sexual orientation. So all of the things that traditionally have been considered like being really intimate traits and character traits, and we can now just basically infer by looking at your online profile. And we did it for everybody who signed up for the conference from their <laughs> login. Absolutely. <laughs> well, it's not just your Facebook, it's like your credit card, it's your smartphone, so all of this has been tapped, so don't you, don't you worry. Like, I, this is funny, because like, when you talk about it in, in conferences and SDs context, it's like there's always people who say like, oh, but I'm totally safe, I don't use Facebook, so haha, like there's nothing you can do about it. And it's like, let's face it, it's just not true because we can tap into your credit card spending, for example, into your smartphones. And I think that's also the, 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 the kind of transition to where it, things might become like more morally questionable and unethical is like, how far can we go? So how far can we go in terms of the, the footprints that we're using? Is it okay if we take your Facebook likes that are publicly available anyway? If we think ahead, like if, is your smartphone much more private because we can actually link it back to you as a person? If we know that, let's say we just get your geolocation, we can see that 10 hours a night you stay in like a specific location, it's very easy to infer that this is basically your home. Um, so there's like the footprints get more and more intimate and it, I think it just doesn't, doesn't stop there, right? Like you could think of the future where we have chips inside our body that kind of measure our physiology. We could kind of just decode your genome to see um, how, like basically what is your predisposition like in terms of preferences, in terms of behavior. And I guess the question is really like, like where do we stop? Is it okay to learn that much about people? Do we need their consent? Like 
Is stuff that's posted on Facebook that's publicly available, should we even have to ask you for consent? Or is it something like archival data, stuff that's published in the newspapers? I think that's where the boundaries are coming in in the sense that it's getting creepy. So it's not that you learn so much about yourself um, because you complete a questionnaire and you know what's happening. So it's quite like, easy to understand what, what's behind those questions. But it's really kind of imposed on you and you have no control over what's happening. And what, what are your, your ethical boundaries? Like, it, what, None. What? <laughs> no. you, you, think, you think as long as we can learn more about people, it's fine? I think it has mostly to do with consent and like transparency. So I feel like in my point of view, and it's like a very personal view, I think as long as you tell people like what's happening with their data and help them to understand it, um, it's probably going to be, be okay as long if it's just for the sake of learning something about people, the second question is what do you do with it? So, and that's where Cambridge Analytica comes in, right? So if you use it to discourage people from going out on election day and putting in their vote, then that's undermining like the, the principle of democracy. So it's not it's not the kind of not the point of learning something about people, but it's then using it against them and using it against society. Moran, do you want to Give us a yeah, some special thing about what we can do with the brain or our body in the future. So Sandra said that you can get into your credit cards and Facebook likes, but at least you tell yourself, okay, I'm going to be off the grid. That's where I come. And we say, okay, even if you're off the grid, you carry your brain with you anywhere. And the question now is, what's there? So the experiment that I want to tell you about, it kind of uh, will suggest that there's one more layer that is important to think about is the experiment has to do with um, your memories and your identity in your head. So the idea that we all carry is that we live in the present and the present takes about a second and a half. And everything else is memories. So everything that happened in your uh, life as a child, all the experiences, they all are stored in your brain and you use them and the current moment to draw your personality and create a, a complex narrative of who you are. Which means that if someone gets into your memories and change something there, we can actually change the course of direc direction of your behavior such that you will wake up and think something else. And I'm saying wake up not just randomly. Turns out that there are a few moments in your day where your brain, if you want, reassesses your personality. One of those is when you're sleeping. So when you're sleeping for, say, seven hours a night, you're not just shutting down the systems and wait. You also have a lot of systems that actually come to life and start thinking about things differently. A lot of your brain is actually more active when you're sleeping than when you're awake. And what we learned in one of the studies we've been is that uh, in a, say, six or seven hours night, there are specific windows that happen about every 90 minutes where your brain actually looks at the past experiences of the last day or two evaluates them, changes the weights of what's important, erases some things, strengthens other things, and wakes up with different impressions about life. And one of the things we learned is that if that's the case, if there are moments like that, we can come in those moments and help your brain choose different ex experiences and amplify them. So here's what I mean by that. We take people that go to sleep, and in the specific window of time where your, their brain is thinking about reality, we spray a smell, let's say the smell of nicotine, into their nose. This makes their brain now think about smoking, and then we immediately spray afterwards the smell of rotten eggs, which is a smell that's known to penetrate your brain without waking you up. And just doing this pairing enough time in the specific window of time when your brain is carrying information will make you wake up after the night and actually, for some reason, not be as enthusiastic about smoking. Somehow your brain has this pairing now that uh, smoking is a bad experience. For a few days, you actually will carry that. Now, this is a great idea. You take people who are smokers, they want to quit smoking, you have to go to sleep. Unbeknownst to them, you do things to your brain, they wake up and they don't want to smoke. But the idea there doesn't end with smoking. Anything that we can trigger using smells in a specific window of time will activate your memories. So now you can think of a company saying, instead of having a person not smoke, I'm going to make them want to buy this particular di diet drink or this particular chocolate. And this is where uh, our knowledge is taken to the extreme can be ethics. I know the room is full of people that are in the business world. You can immediately see that when scientists discover a great idea, there's also with it the idea of something else. So. Uh, when Amazon tells you that Alexa is now going to also monitor your sleep, that's when I would start being worried. <laughs> and and wh what are the ethical challenges for you? Like, why, why is that not a good thing to do? So I think that 
ultimately, the, there are kind of a couple, but I'll, I'll focus on one. The idea of changing behavior Taking something that you have and doing something to you that will change it is something that we all aspire to. I can think of any person in the room, if you ask a, a question, there will be something that you don't like about your spouse, right? Maybe about yourself even. And, and, and so behavior change is something that we all aspire to, and we know it's really, really hard. And the more scientists give us tools to do that, whether those are tools that have to do with figuring out your, uh, your behavior and helping you create a situations by which it's going to be easier to amplify different behaviors, which Dan can tell you about, whether it's actually figuring out things about you that you don't know about yourself by looking at your behavior online and telling you, you know, you actually say that you're going to be like this, but you end up being like that. Now we can help you understand all of those moments. Once we get to the root, which is in your brain, your behavior, we actually give you a tool that is too powerful. It's too powerful because in the hands of anyone, it can be used to create behaviors that you want or ones that you don't want. And specifically, talking about sleep is a uniquely a, a scary analytical moment because we're not there to actually protect ourselves. So I think this is one is particularly one that I wanted to amplify here because right now it's not something that is in our life, but it's very, very quickly something that will be available if we know how to look at your brain and find a specific window of time where it works. So that's, I think, why it's important for this room. So, so if I think about uh, Sandra's example and yours, um, both of them were about vulnerability and if there was a benevolent dictator who would control your sleep or give you good messages, you would not be morally uh, opposed to that. But, but you're basically saying you're creating a vulnerability. We're understanding people's vulnerability. And now people are exposed and more easily uh, persuaded or uh, can change um, how they behave. And I want to give a, a slightly different example. Um, so the reality is that uh, most of us live in multiple ways in which, in, in ways we're not that happy with. Uh, so just as a, as a, um, as a quick survey, uh, how many people here in the last month uh, have eaten more than you think you should? Just kind of a general, okay. Um, how many people here in the last month have exercised less than you think you should? Okay. <laughs> How many people here uh, raising your hand has been the most exercise you got this, <laughs> this week? And I can ask more, right? I can ask you questions about uh, texting and driving, washing your hands when you left the bathroom, and, and, and so on and so forth. I was in the bathroom earlier, so I know some of you <laughs> did not wash your hands. Um, and these are all problems of self-control. These are problems where you tell yourself, I want to be better. I want to eat better, I want to exercise, I don't want to text and drive, and so on. But the reality is that life is really tempting. Life is really tempting, and therefore we fail, and we don't fail very rarely, we fail very frequently. And just kind of to give you an, a, an example of this, there was a study that asked the question of how often do we die too soon because we made a bad decision? Right? So imagine we take all the people who die in the U.S., and for each of them we say, did they die because they made some bad decision? Uh, driving drunk, for example, and killing yourself is a mistake that would kill yourself. And they ask, what percentage of human mortality is attributed to bad decisions? And they, they estimated it, what they thought happened 100 years ago and what happens now. And about 100 years ago, it was about 10%. Think about 100 years ago, how could you make a bad decision that would kill you? Not that easy. Now it's more than 40%. How come? What has happened over the years? Are we, are we dumber? No. We have just created a world that is really, really tempting. Obesity, diabetes, smoking, texting and driving, all of those things are amazing in terms of the ability of temptation. And some of these technologies are amazing, right? Like the donut, unbelievable. Like you get to pack so much fat and sugar in a small, <laughs> compact container. If you could only give small portions of these to kids in Africa, things would be wonderful. <laughs> but of course, we make them big and we serve them to people who don't, who don't need them. So temptation is all around us. And there's all kinds of mechanisms to try and overcome temptation. One of them, as you probably remember, is Ulysses' contracts. You remember the story of Ulysses? Ulysses knew that if the sirens will come, he will direct the boat and crash it. So what did he do? He asked the sailors to tie him to the mast. And this way he was able to hear the call of the sirens, but he was unable to redirect the boat. 
and he asked the sailors to put wax in their ears. So the sailors are unaware that temptation even uh, exists. And, and this is a very kind of general way to think about, or two general ways to think about overcoming temptation. One is to tie our hands behind our back so we're not able to act, and the other one is just to don't know that temptation exists. So, so with this in mind, uh, we created a little app that helps people eat better, exercise, and take the medication on time. And it's a little app with a turtle on it, a Tamaguchi. And the turtle wakes up every day happy, and then as people exercise, take the medication and exercise, the turtle remains happy, and as people stop doing those things, the turtle becomes sad and sad and sad and goes into its shell, and eventually kind of just goes to sleep in its shell. And it turns out the turtle by itself does nothing to change behavior. It's a really nice animation, but people don't care enough. But what our turtle also does is to delete other apps from the phone. <laughs> uh, this is angry turtle, right? So, and, and when we install it, uh, the, the app analyzes how frequently people use which apps, <laughs> and those are the first ones to go, right? Facebook, Twitter, music, and so on. And uh, our app, nobody can delete it. <laughs> and, and this is a Ulysses contract, right? Like, now, right now, right now, we give it to patients who had heart surgery. And we say, hey, uh, right now, you think you want to exercise, take your pills, and eat better. But in two weeks, you'll eat fried chicken again. I live in the south of the US. Um, and we say, why don't we install this app on your phone, and this app will protect you. And then we install this app on the phone. They agree, of course. But then they're kind of stuck, right? And the whole principle is based on the fact that we're taking freedom out of those people. Like, I wish we could make eating healthy, taking your medication, exercising fun. We're unable to do it. We haven't figured out a way. So what are we doing? We're making not doing it more miserable. So people wake up. And then the turtle starts getting unhappy, and then people have to behave well, uh, not because they want to be healthy in two years, but because they don't want to lose Facebook. Um, and, and by the way, if they lose the apps, they show up every day, every morning. It's, it starts again. Um, and the reason I'm bringing it up is as an is a ethical challenge, because we are creating a system that punishes people immediately for not ideal behavior. And when you create this, many people would say, you know what, today I don't want this app. But of course, we don't let them do that. We limit people's freedom. We help them. Uh, and eventually, we're saying, your health is more important to us than what you're interested in doing on any particular day. And we'll create a system that will help you be a better long-term long thinking self uh, this way. And another type of question is to say, who else should live with this app, right? So um, how many of you would want your kids uh, to have this app? Probably quite a few of you. How many of you want yourself uh, to live this way? Not so, not so much fun. But what are the limits of how much we're willing to eliminate human freedom from the equation because it's helping us behave, behave better? So. I, I, before I, I take us to other levels of, of analytical, I was going to ask you, what's your answer? <laughs> you have kids and you, you have uh, all the tools. Yeah. What would be the right time? Oh. So, so I value human freedom to some degree. I think it's a good value to have. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, all else being equal. But, but I, also, I also want us to have a good understanding of the damage than having freedom creates, right? So uh, for example, texting and driving. Uh, it's crazy that we allow people to do that, right? We, we create these very addictive mechanisms that people can uh, check their phones obsessively all the time. And then we say, but please don't do it when you're in the car. Uh, but also, you could do it for navigation and music, but not for texting and, and so on. It's a very, very confusing state. And, we're giving people a tool that they can kill themselves and kill others. So what, what I think we need to do is we need to make a list of the damages that those behaviors are creating. 
And every time that the damage is clear and large, I'm happy to be paternalistic. And uh, as the damage becomes smaller, sure, we can, we can give up some things. But there are many things in life, especially in health, that uh, people are creating tremendous damage. And, and it looks, at least in the US, you know what was the biggest thing that helped fight smoking? In the US, we reduced smoking for about 40% to 20%. I'm not sure here what the reduction has been, but and the, one of the biggest contributor has been the invention of the world of the word secondhand smoke, passive smoking, secondhand smoke. What what was so important about this word? It made people from killing themselves to being potential murderers, right? It basically transitioned people from you can kill yourself, it's fine, to you're killing us, and if you're killing us, that's not okay. The truth is, in society, our lives are interlinked in important ways. If somebody's a diabetic or somebody has hep C or whatever it is, it has an influence on all of our, all of our lives. And, and because of that, I'm more morally okay with forcing people to behave better. You represent France, and so I think that at some point you, should, you two should also answer what's, your ability, uh, what's the level of agreement you have when it comes to paternalism. But so I, I was also asked to uh, take us to additional levels of uh, ethics and tell you about at least one more example of uh, some things that we couldn't do until recently and we are uh, exploring right now and should be in your mind when you kind of leave this room and think what world you want to live in. So beyond uh, looking at your behavior, changing that by creating all kinds of contracts that allow you to do that, beyond looking at your uh, behavior that is the uh, footprint that you leave, if you're looking at your brain, we can also look at your body and start uh, figuring out things about you that maybe will change you in a more drastic way. And again, you can be a judge of whether you like it or not. So one of the studies that uh, is interesting that came out in the last couple of years looks at the idea of a youth and growth hormones on basically being old. So you can think for yourself uh, uh, what age you think would be the right age for you to die and how much of your life you want to spend as an old person versus a young person. And I know that the world is changing in how we look at that. But there's kind of a common uh, belief among old people that youth is a, a really, really good time to cherish. And for a while, there was a clear understanding that you spend some time as a young person, sometimes as an adult, and sometimes as an old person, and they kind of divided somehow. And uh, there are different levels of wisdom in th those times, but they never go back. The, the arrow just goes in one direction. Well, uh, we now are starting to play with this arrow in multiple ways. First of all, we realize that we can start replacing parts of you and keeping uh, new ones as uh, things that will be making you young. So think about it in the following way. If I told you, hey, I want you to buy a laptop right now and use the same laptop for the next 80 years, you would say that's a really bad deal. But that's the deal we have with our body. We're kind of born, we, that's what we have. You don't think about replacement parts as often, and we now have surgery to replace the heart or maybe some parts of us, but we commonly just leave it what we have. Now, scientists and neuroscientists are one angle of that, but also others are looking at that, are realizing that we can actually replace parts of you, and in doing so, actually renew your body so you get to start new with some things. The most extreme version of that right now is studies that were done in mice, not in humans yet, that show that you can actually take multiple animals and circulate their bloodstream. So you actually circulate the bloodstream of one mouse in another and back, and the outcome of this study was that an old mouse that had its blood circulated with a young mouse actually reversed aged. So the old one became younger, the young one became older, and they met in the middle. Which suggests that now, we're, without understanding actually what is the mechanism, we found the ultimate youth hormone, which just circulates your blood with the blood of a baby, and here you are, an eight-year-old becoming a 40-year-old. The size are, are basically all we needed. So, so, of course, this is not something that we're doing with humans right now, but it uh, just... Uh, we just need to find a baby. I know, the baby's exactly. fucked, really. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, for, I mean, you can think of like creating, you know, creating babies just for the sake of doing that in many, many ways, but the idea here is that, again, once we found that with the mice, I should clear, uh, uh, um, we opened up another Pandora box. 
And I think what we're talking about here are two levels of like ethics. One is the Pandora boxes. And of those, I think in the next two days, you're going to hear about a lot. AI is in a Pandora box like that. Uh, genetics are a Pandora box like that. We know, a lot of those are, are basically Pandora boxes that uh, pave a road for a really, really extreme way. And what you hear from us are, I don't know what to call them, but they're the small scale things that because there aren't as scary as you know creating a new species of animals, they sound a lot less kind of intimidating, but they're actually the ones we confront day to day. So the paternalism Dan speaks about the ability to change people's uh, uh, you know content by showing them by preferences, by showing the different content is I think the scariest thing for this room because uh, Sandra will tell you it, it it can not just make you you know buy something uh, that you didn't want to buy before, it could actually end up making you go in different directions. And you have multiple examples I haven't even for that. talked about it yet, but it's <laughs> getting there. So, jump. Oh, no. OK, go. Cool. Um, so I'm not going to change any body parts. Just for the for the sake of this discussion. But but you are dating an older man, is that? I was I was actually <laughs> offering. I was offering. It's like we can have a contract. Let's just talk about this later. <laughs> just depends on what you have to offer in return. Um, but I think. <laughs> but really, so like the really it's kind of related. So I said it's really ethical discussion. Yeah, let's have an ethical discussion. <laughs> let's take a vote. <laughs> let's take, yeah, it sh should be transparent, right? Um, no, I think what I, the second idea that I wanted to talk about, and it's kind of related to the first idea, um, is if we think about the fact that we can now understand humans better than they understand themselves, like, how, what do we do with that in terms of customization? And I actually want to start with the extreme. So, right, like everybody knows about customization and how Google is doing it and stuff. But if we think about the technological development that we're seeing right now, you could imagine a world like in not that far down the road, like 20 years, 30 years, where we basically all walk around with our like augmented virtual realities, and each of us has like an entirely different experience from, from the rest of us. And that kind of has like large implications for the social relationships that we have, for like everything, the way that we interact. Um, and I think it's really starting now. So I mean, I'm sure that all of you have heard about echo chambers and the fact that it, like our lives become so personalized and we're, we're not even aware of that is that like what you see on your internet, like on your, on your Facebook, might be entirely different from what I see. Um, and again, like there might be use cases where this is amazing because there's just so much, so this is actually like, there's a lot of research saying that there's, the internet is just so big that there's no way we can kind of filter through it. There's like absolutely no way that we can go through all the content on, on Google, go through all the content on Amazon. So it makes sense to have like this filter. But again, if we, if we take it to the extreme and we're not just personalizing it based on, let's say, your location or your age and gender, it really means that we're kind of creating this personalized experience for each and one of you, and we might not even be able to connect um, anymore as a, as a society because we just have a completely, like an entirely different understanding of what it means to be us, of what it means to be human, of what it means to be living like in a city or in a, in a town. So again, this is like the idea that we can customize stuff and now everybody is kind of, like I mean, it's, it has like already this ethical debate around how far should we go? Should we allow companies like Cambridge Analytica to manipulate people? But I think like it's just going to get more and more extreme where it's not just manipulating you, but it's really just putting you, like taking you out of context and putting you into an entirely new world. Okay, thank you. <laughs> 